Okay, this was done in one minute. Okay, so everybody, you should be receiving a notice right now that this session will be recorded so we can amplify our conversation across the world. Right, and uh, please feel free to pin uh, various speakers uh, as you um, take a look uh, for, your, for, for your view. All right, so we're gonna get going. Um, just a very, very quick housekeeping. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, for optimal viewing, please change your change the speaker view and keep on mute for the duration of the panel. As a reminder, this meeting will be recorded. If you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to use our chat function. Uh, we're gonna see a few more people trickle in here. And with that, without further ado, I'm going to get started. So yeah, so good after, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, good morning. If you're ambitious and you really wanted to catch this and you're on the opposite side of the world. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Teresa Nyabese. I am the chair of the Diversity Inclusion Advisory Committee for CIM. I'm joined today by my uh, colleagues in the mining industry, Annie Lawrenson, who is a governance professional, uh, Stanley Opara, who is a market analyst, as well as Michael Adu, they will be our panelists today. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation and uh, getting to know folks a bit better on the panel, as well as really seeking to learn from you who are attending. Please don't feel this is a one-way dialogue. We really would like to hear from you and kind of, you know, ask those questions and feel free. Uh, you're amongst uh, very uh, welcoming colleagues here today. All right. So without further ado, I wanted to begin by uh, just getting to know our panelists. Um, first person I wanted to talk about, talk to is uh, Stanley Opara. Uh, Stanley Opara, uh, thank you for doing this with us today. Thank you very much, Theresa, for, for having me. Yes, um, you know, Stanley, when I was describing you as a market analyst, I, I don't know about other people on the call immediately. I think of commodities. I get quite confused. So take us through your career journey. How did you, how did you come to be a market analyst today? Yeah, if you thought about commodities, mm -hmm. um, you're right. Oh, <laughs> you're you're yeah. right. That's, that's basically uh, what I look at. But I look at a special commodity, and that's carbon. Mm. Uh, but interestingly, I'm a geophysicist uh, by training. So I started my career as a subsurface um, geophysicist, basically finding oil around the world. I started in West Africa, worked on some of the oil fields there in West Africa. Then I moved out to the North Sea, worked in, in England uh, doing geophysics work. But as curiosity would have it uh, along the line, I'm sure I'm gonna go into the details later, but uh, out of curiosity and the need to learn more, I pivoted my career at some point. And today I do market analysis looking after uh, the carbon markets, uh, trying to understand how organizations need to, to go uh, with the whole energy transition um, that's going around the world right now. But that's more like a, a short uh, introduction of myself. I'm sure I'll go into the details later, Thursday. So just to position yourself geographically for us, where are you located in Canada? I am in Calgary at the moment. Okay. All right, and just so that when we're hearing from you and just putting context, where else in Canada have you been geographically located? Just so we know where you're coming from and, and when you are sharing some of your experiences. Oh, sweet. So I moved to Canada in 2017 to, to get my MBA. So I studied at um, Ivy Business School in London, Ontario. So I finished there and spent um, about a year as well in, in London after school before I moved over to, to Calgary. So I have lived in London and now in Calgary. Actually, there's another, I did live in Fort McMurray for a bit as well. Um, moved to, to Calgary in 2019. By December of 2019, I moved up to Fort McMurray to, to the oil sands, basically to, to get close to the oil sands mining and yep. then moved back to, to Calgary last, last May. So three, three cities um, in about five years. Wow. 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 So you definitely have a diversity of experiences there. Yeah. Well, very nice to meet you here today. Uh, Michael Adu is a, a safety professional. And Michael, tell us more about where you are in the in this beautiful country and uh, what brings you into mining. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, Michael, I'm in on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Beautiful Vancouver Island. I work with Mara Falls, the mine. We actually located in a provincial park, which is 
the only mine located in the provincial park. So I get to see the provincial park out of my office. So that's awesome. And I also used to live in Calgary before moving to uh, Vancouver Island. So in mine, and I studied actually metallurgical engineering as first degree, and I, my interest was drawn into that from my uncle who used to work in the oldest mining company in Ghana, Anglo Gold Ashanti, for those who know about it. So he drew my attention uh, into mining. He comes home and tells me stories about mining and all the stuff. So that drew my curiosity. So in high school, I did a bit of, uh, I did science, did chemistry, and was fascinated with chemistry. So I decided to pursue metallurgical engineering. And that was my goal. My goal was to be <laughs> a metallurgist <laughs> and pursue metallurgical engineering. But during one of my internships, and I fell in love with safety. So whilst I was doing internship with one of the company in Ghana, I come from Ghana, West Africa, originally, I was helping out with toolbox talks and all those stuff and helping with inductions for when the safety person leaves site. So when I completed that, I went back to school and came back for my, in Ghana, you have to do graduate training or national service once you finish university. I was doing metallurgy actually, and the person who was doing the safety job resigned and I was asked to take over the role until they get somebody in that role. So I said, oh, that's fine. That's a good opportunity for me to learn something new. So I said, I took the opportunity and I, I think I, I did well. So I was offered a position of a health and safety coordinator. So I didn't go through becoming a safety officer, just straight to a coordinator of a process plant, uh, having over a hundred people in that uh, process plant where I was managing health and safety. So it was a big switch for me from uh, metallurgical engineering, having a career focused in metallurgical engineering to into health and safety. But also it's in the mining industry. So that's, I think that's been good for me. You're on mute, Teresa. Yeah, I was going to say, this has got to be one person who does it, that's me. Uh, but I'll say, it's sort of, certainly interesting how our pivots can happen, and it would be really nice to tease that out afterwards. Uh, thank you, Michael, for doing this with us today. And Annie, tell us about your journey. Uh, so Annie's with us. as a She's a governance professional in mining. And I must say, Annie, I'll be very honest, when I first met you, and I, and you know, Annie was saying she's a corporate secretary. I was so confused. I was like, what is, what does that even mean? And what, who's using the word secretary these days? Anyway, so I was quite ignorant. So please educate us. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much. Before I begin that, I, I, I would like to do a little bit of a land acknowledgement here. Um, I think we were supposed to go in a certain order. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I'd like to acknowledge that I, I'm in Toronto. So I'm on the traditional territory of the many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. So I'd like to invite everyone to just take a moment to uh, acknowledge the lands that they're on as well. Okay, so corporate secretary, yes, I know that term yes. is very confusing. I have been, uh, behind or at the front of many conversations where I was asked if I am sitting in the typing pool or, and I said, in this day and age, I don't think anybody sits in a typing pool. And even if anybody remembers what that is. So corporate sector basically is when a company is established, you, there's three, um, when you open or start a company, you have to have three roles. One is CFO, CEO, CEO and a corporate secretary. So corporate sector, basically where I like to think of us as the librarians, of a company, we basically know where all the documents are, corporate records, we maintain that, and we know all the bodies, <laughs> for lack of a better term, but um, and all the skeletons in the closet. But um, it, is a, it is a role that is very interesting to me. I did not go to school to study to be a corporate secretary. I think in some countries it's known as a company secretary. Mm -hmm. I just sort of fell into the role as well. Like uh, Michael, uh, it's one of those things where I just put my hand up and I said, okay, well, I'd like to, you know, sort of try that out. Um, over the years, the role has evolved and we are now sort of pivoting into what we're calling governance professionals as the world evolves. So um, I am currently director of governance and corporate secretary for London Mining Corporation. Um, we are based in Toronto head office and we have about six, we're in six different mining jurisdictions. 
So it keeps me busy. I uh, work with the, the board of directors as well as senior management and uh, do all the regulatory filings that you can think of, CDAR, you name it, SETI, insider filings. These are all little insider secrets that would need a whole other session for us to go into. And how did I get into mining? Uh, I just fell into mining. I, uh, my first role in mining was with um, a company called Ore Resources. I don't know if everybody knows that. I might be dating myself, but mm -hmm. um, this was back in 2005. They were taken over by tech. So I moved on to another mining company. Um, and I've really enjoyed um, sort of being in the resource space. So, and so that's a little bit about me. Yeah, I know. Very nice to meet everyone. Uh, you know, you, you're all so you're all definitely accomplished in your respective fields. But one theme I'm hearing is this theme of transitions and, you know, going from one thing to another, you know, in Stanley's case, going from being a geophysicist to a market analyst, uh, Stanley, take us a little bit, because, you know, it's Black, it's Black History Month, and we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, in my circles, about we want to celebrate and we want to showcase that there's so much talent, uh, there are lots of Black folks doing amazing things, and, you know, it's my pride to actually to be doing this about mining. Uh, so, Stanley, you know, for folks who are listening, who are also interested in this idea of, you know, pivoting and, and changing roles, uh, what has been your key to doing this um, over the years? Thanks, Theresa. Uh, I would say that curiosity is a key ingredient. Um, the need to learn, to try new things, and the boldness to actually go out there and try those things, I think that has been one of the, the recipes for my pivot throughout my career. And I'll give an example. So I, I started as a geophysicist, basically doing a lot of seismic work, trying to understand reservoir basins and where all it could be found. Uh, it, it, different kind of mining now. And so I got interested in understanding drilling and measurements. Basically, how do these, after I tell them, okay, this is the reservoir, it's at this depth. You have the drillers go down and punch the holes and actually drill. So I got an interest in understanding how they do that because it could be very complex. I mean, you're drilling holes deep offshore and what are the safety concerns? We know some of the safety concerns because we've seen incidents happen in the industry over the years. So I got curious to understand how they did their job. And I approached some of my friends who were in drilling and I asked them, hey, what is it that you guys do? And what do I need to do if I need to become a drilling engineer? And of course they told me, okay, this is what you need to do. And the good thing is most companies have internal resources where you can go on and learn. Uh, I know the company I worked for at the time had resources internally. So I did go on there and try to understand what I needed to do. So I signed up and did some learning and got conversant with drilling. I eventually didn't become a drilling engineer, but I leveraged my background as a geophysicist to do something called seismic guided drilling, where I did apply some of my seismic knowledge into yeah. the drilling industry. And, and curiosity again. So I started, I, I moved roles. I moved there from, from Lagos in Nigeria. I moved to, to the UK. And then I started doing this and talking to more senior people within organizations that we worked for at the time. That was when I realized that, okay, these people were concerned about their business. They want the job to be done, but they also want the job to be done profitably. Mm -hmm. and that's why I said, okay, maybe I need to understand how to run a business. So I made the decision to go get an MBA. I went back to school and decided to, to get an MBA because I was curious about that. And then I finished and I thought, okay, maybe I needed to understand um, other part, other industry, not just the oil and gas, but what other industries exist within the energy space. One thing I wanted to stay within energy, but mm -hmm. I wanted to do something. So I became a management consultant. And I think that's where you and I met, yes. um, Theresa, when I, during my time as a management consultant. And that exposed me to, you know, the hard rock mining industry, base mm -hmm. metals, and all those sort of things. And from there, I moved back to oil sands mining, I joined the company I work for now, which is Suncor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I moved up to Fort McMurray to try to understand how oil sands mining is actually done. And that was out of curiosity as well. And good thing is, working for great companies, I mean, they give you the opportunity to do the things you want to do. And I think I need to bring that, uh, make that point clear here. If you're interested in something, mm -hmm. I think you should raise your hand. You. you First, you try to get the requisite experience or knowledge that you need 
understand what gaps that you don't have, raise your hand after you fill those gaps and say you want to try something. What I have found in my career is most times you will be given that opportunity if you try hard enough. I have seen that. Uh, I know there are barriers. I know this is Black History Month. We know there are certain challenges in progressing in careers, but I do find that if you knock the door hard enough, opportunities will come for you to do what you're passionate about. So yeah. I did that and then I moved on, did oil science mining, but I Again, out of curiosity, I want to understand what was going on with energy transition. And one of the things that's happening right now is the carbon markets. We mm -hmm. need to offset our carbon emissions. Most companies have come out to make 2030 and 2050 net zero targets. The way they need to do that is through the carbon markets. They need to purchase carbon credits, to offset their emissions. I thought maybe it would be a good thing to do. So I studied up and tried to understand that market. An opportunity came, I raised my hand, maybe I want to do that. And, and um, last May, I got the role. And right now, I'm basically looking at the carbon markets, trying to understand what carbon price will be into the future and how our company can position themselves to meet our 2030 and 2050 goals. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a journey, but um, curiosity is one thing that we always need to have in front of our minds. And we need to also raise our hands if we find something interesting that we want to, we think we might want to do. Yeah, I know certainly, you know, very interesting. And, and I think for us who are listening and feeling a bit empowered, but inspired by what you're saying, it's, uh, it, it's really this, that idea of making yourself prepared for that next opportunity by, you know, self-educating and self-developing. Any, do you want to, you can add to that? Yeah, I wanted to add to that. I mean, I want to touch on a point that um, um, Stanley sort of touched on there, which is, you know, as I'm going to go into a little bit about as people of color, and as we we're in talking about, you know, in line with our theme of Black History Month, I always see it as our Black futures, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I do find with um, people of color or, you know, Black, Indigenous, you know, people of color, we tend to not want to put our hands up to do something. And I think what you said there about the curiosity is something that we should all embrace and try to um, sort of be curious about what your colleague is doing, right? Put your hands up, um, speak up, you have a voice. Um, and, you know, I'm originally from Zimbabwe and we're, and growing up, we're always taught that women should not be loud, you know, <laughs> go voices shouldn't go above a certain octave. And I'm not saying be loud, but I, I think part of it too, growing up and having sort of that background allows us, especially black women and, and black people in general to sort of internalize things, right? Like we don't, we try to, you come out, but then you remember that little voice or you hear your mother's voice in the head saying, okay, no, you know, step back a little bit. But I think we should, we should really come out. We have a lot to bring to the table. We've learned, we've got, we've lived all over the world. Like, I mean, I'm from Zimbabwe. I came here. I've lived in South Africa, Botswana. I've been, you know, I lived in London. And so I bring a world of experience, um, which I think if I don't, if I don't speak up, no one will ever know that. So I think we should really try to be curious, put your hand up, learn that, take that next opportunity. You just never know what's around the corner. Um, that's yeah, what I wanted to add to that. And, you know, I'm going to uh, go to Mike. Thank you, Annie. I'm going to go to Michael in a second because, you know, when I when I hear the advice of speaking up and taking the chance and putting yourself forward, I don't know about folks on the call, but you know what words, and I'm sure somebody's going to guess this, you know what's coming to my mind right now is this idea of psychological safety in the workplace mm -hmm. and ensuring that it's being fostered. And Michael, I do, I know you're a safety professional. Maybe you can tie into this by uh, bringing us into the importance of psychological safety to foster some of what Annie's speaking about, about speaking up and what Stanley's talking about, raise your hand, talk, you know, speak about the opportunity. So Mike, if you wanna unmute yourself. So yeah, thanks, uh, Theresa. I think uh, just to add to Stanley and uh, what Annie also said, we tend to put ourselves in a box and then we internalize a lot of things and we don't speak up, we don't talk about things. And as you just mentioned, psychological safety, which is becoming a key uh, safety uh, thing that we are looking at now based on the fact that the over the past years, our focus has always been on the physical safety side, where we look at physical health stuff and not what is happening in, in, in the mental health space in somebody's head or whatever it is. So people 
need to speak up, tend not to put themselves in a box. And uh, for those who, those of us who grew up in Africa, I'm sure it cuts across almost all African countries. We are taught this spirit of humbleness or timidity. Uh, it's, it's, it borders in between that. So there's a, a very thin line between that being humble and being timid. Mm -hmm. And so we end up uh, with those uh, traits. And when we come to a society like this, where people speak up, people are bold, people talk, we find it intimidating. And uh, we sometimes cow in our shells and we, we are unable to talk about things. So I think uh, those of us, who, as we are talking about celebration, those of us who have been able to break that barrier is because we are able to speak up, talk about things and see the other person across the room as a colleague and somebody of not of superior color or superior intelligence. You talk about things on an intelligent, an intellectual level and not as a color-based discussion. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the other person as a colleague that you are talking to, you're, you don't get stressed, you don't become timid, you, you don't put in that humility because you are talking about things based on intellect. And intellect knows no color, right? It's what is in your brain, it's what you've studied, it's what you know, that is what you are putting across. And that is what has helped me, for example, I'm sure a lot of people on this call have also been through that where they've put away, they put out that color and they put it aside and they fo focus on intellect rather than uh, color-based discussion. And so when you start doing that and focusing on stuff, your stress levels reduce and that's the that's the impact on the, your psychological safety, right? So yeah, it affects you at work and affects you at home as well, right? Whatever you do at work, you take home. So you go to work and you've been you've been pushed the corner based on your color, based on whatever it is. You you might take it home and take it on your wife or husband or your kids or whoever, even your your dog or whatever pet you have at home, you end up taking those things. So, Why am I getting yeah. kicked by my owner? It's been a bad day at work. Okay, we don't want that. Um, so my, <laughs> my, my, you know, definitely, you know, these are all very important themes, uh, especially this idea of psychological safety. I, I, I do personally believe psychological safety is a two-way street, right? We have to create the environment that yeah. foster psychological safety. Mm -hmm. So people feel safe to bring up things. You know, when you are all talking, I, I, I'm a big fan of saying, um, of really believing that we don't walk alone. And you know that there's an old African pro proverb that I'm gonna paraphrase, which says, you know, if you wanna go far, go alone. But if you wanna go further, you need to go together. So each one of you, I'm just, I really want you to reflect on this and maybe share with us. I'll start with Stanley. Stanley, who have been some of the pivotal mentorship you've received? And then I would like you to dip into what you would consider sponsorship. Because as we know, there's a difference in somebody mentoring you, taking care of you, hearing you out, to somebody sponsoring you, mentioning your name in a room full of opportunities. And I'm very curious if you felt that in your career path. Oh, that I, this question, you know, rings so close to my heart because um, through my career so far, I have been very fortunate to have both good mentors and and sponsors and i will touch on sponsorship because i think that's what we need at this stage of the conversation right we we have talked a lot about mentorship uh, we now need to advance to the stage where people can actually you know call your name in meetings where you're not there and say i i know that person i know stanley please could you do this or that for that for for him so uh during my career i'll talk about a time um very early in my career I, one of my very first bosses uh, that I had. In fact, one of the reasons that I had that transition from Lagos, Nigeria to London, England, you know, he, he took particular interest in ensuring that I progressed in my career. So he would, he would ask me, Stanley, what sort of challenges are you facing right now? Where do you want to go next in your career? What do you want to do? And he, he's, he's retired now. He's a nice British man, um, took so much interest, but he was particularly interested in understanding what I wanted to do with my career and what things I wanted to do, what sort of challenges I was facing. And we had that relationship and he was so instrumental in ensuring that I understood what gaps I had in my, in my skills and ensuring that I had the resources that I needed to fill those gaps to prepare me for the next role that I 
wanted to go into. So I consider him a great mentor. And that was back uh, early in my career. But even right now, I have mentors, not just one. I have people I have monthly check-ins with, you know, to talk about how my career is progressing and what sort of challenges I'm facing, what things I need to do. Now, they are in mm-hmm. my schedule that, that, that I, uh, people I talk to. So I think it's very important and it doesn't have to be just for career. It could be for anything else you want to do in life. It could be for volunteering. We need to understand the volunteering space. How do you get into that space? You might have a mentor who's good at that and you talk to them and they can let you understand how you get into that space. So that's one thing. And for mentorship as well, I think I need to point out that it needs to be organic. It doesn't have to be transactional. So you don't go to someone hoping that they will, you know, get you that next job. No, it needs to be an organic relationship. You come up to them because you genuinely know there's something they have that you want to learn about. So I think right. that's very important. Right. No, for well. sure. For sure. For sure. And I mean, here listening to you, I can I can tell that that fellow in the UK had a big influence in you and taking interest from with with you and uh, really fostering your confidence that there are people out there who you can actually lean on. And Andy, have you had a similar experience either in sponsorship or mentorship? Um, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, over the years, I've had, you know, many, many mentors, um, but also some really great sponsors at the same time. And I think it is very key for, um, especially for women, um, and especially, again, you know, I hate to sound like a book, but Black women, we do need um, that sponsorship. We do need that uh, mentorship because most of us are are in a, in a world that we are, so we didn't grow up in, right? Like, you know, as immigrants or even if you were born here, sometimes we are not exposed to certain things that, you know, maybe somebody who's my, to my right here, who's my colleague who grew up here in Canada, um, had those opportunities and we didn't. So I think I've had some people that I think I I would say to be where I am today would not have been possible without, I think, three people that really sort of took an interest in me um, and is continuing today. I'm fortunate to work for a company that does sort of uh, recognize my, my abilities um, just as a, a person and um, as a woman, right? Because sometimes those are the things that you you need those people to speak your name behind those doors. But at the same time, you also have to put a little work into it, right? It's not just a, mm-hmm. a one-way street. People can't just speak your name when you have you don't have some, bring something to the table for them to be able to put that forward. So I think let's not forget that that sponsorship also comes with you putting in the effort. It's not just going to land on your, you know, in your lap. So you have to put in that effort. You have to, again, let's go back to the speaking up. Find your voice. It's mm-hmm. very important in this world. If you want to get anywhere, you have to have a voice. If you just wait in the in the shadows, it won't it won't come. So mm-hmm. put in the work as well. You know, put your put your hand up. I want to do this, and there's no one else to do it. I want to learn it, and you know, people will start to realize. Um, that, you know, Annie's there or Teresa's there or Michael's there, you know. So again, put in the work. Yeah, no, right on. And, and you know, like I, I look at somebody like Michael who has transitioned from being metallurgical to safety mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, even your role right now, would you point to a certain, and when I say mentorship or sponsorship, I mean, it comes in many ways. Some people have actually engaged formal coaches, uh, you know, to actually go through that growth. Michael, what's your story around being men- mentorship and, and sponsorship? So uh, similar to Stanley's story, I've also had uh, sponsorship. I remember earlier when I said when I was in university, I just completed and I had to do a one year uh, national service as we call it in Ghana, uh, as a metallurgist and I was asked to be the health and safety coordinator for the process plant. So it's, it was actually the process plant manager who is an Australian, Ian Dunlop. Uh, he's retired also in Australia now. So he gave me the opportunity so my name was mentioned in a room that I wasn't in. Yeah. So I, looking back, it's my, it must be because of the effort I was putting in, even when I was doing my metallurgical work and all the things I was doing and the respect and all the stuff I was showing and speaking up and talking about stuff in the workplace, uh, about safety. So that's what gave me the opportunity. So Ian Dunlop, 
gave me the opportunity. So after national service, I got a full job. We were about six or seven people, but the others were went away, which was rather unfortunate, but I was asked to stay on as a health and safety coordinator. And it was at a time where we were doing a plant expansion project. For those of you who are familiar with the process plant, a gold processing yeah. plant, $100 million plant expansion project. And this rookie safety coordinator <laughs> was, uh, was put in charge of that project, working with an EPCM contractor uh, to ensure that the project uh, goes on safely and to ensure that the project goes on well as well. Fortunately, uh, by hard work and support of the team that I was working with, I were able to go through that one year expansion project without any lost time injury or mm -hmm. fatality, which was great and which was added to my resume, right? So uh, Ian Dunlop, that person gave me the foot through the door. And even whilst I was doing that job, another contractor on the same property was a mining contractor also there was a discussion. Uh, this was an after work discussion where they've had a dry mess where my name also came up and they also offered me a job, but I had already accepted the company job as well. So sometimes, the, yeah, so that was, so sometimes the, the things we do, which we think uh, people are not looking at, everybody's people are looking at it. And when there's a discussion, you'd be surprised where discussions are held, right? Discussions can be held at a dry mess or at a pub or whatever it is, but your name will come up and then you'll be looked at and you can be uh, contacted for a job. So we need to always do our job, like how we, how it's supposed to be done and go over and above what you're supposed to do. Because I was doing the national service for those of us who are Ghanaians on the panel, on the on the call, you you know, you, you are, it's just, you are given just like a stipend. It's not anything that you get paid for. Nigeria also has something similar, right? But it's just a stipend, uh, something small, but I had to be at work work start at 7.30 because I have monthly safety meetings with the crew. I get to work around 6 or 5.30 to set up and do the safety meeting without any pay. Sometimes the meetings were in the evening. Uh, there's somebody on the call who knows what I'm talking about also very well. So mm -hmm. you do that and at 7.30 p.m., you that's the time you leave the office and you go home. All your yeah. colleagues are home at 5 p.m., right? So those extra efforts that you put in, it wasn't because I wanted to find favor uh, from somebody but I felt it was the right thing to do to ensure that people understand what they're supposed to do when they come to work in terms of the health and safety space. And it was right. something that I found my passion, right? So Right. And you know what what you what you're saying uh, it resonates with me that you know you've been all very fortunate to be well mentored, well sponsored. And I think it's as we're talking about Black History Month and we think of the generation that's coming and our role in ensuring that they have similar experiences. Um, I, you know, and I'm hoping that people listening on the call, I always say it's, it's important to listen, but to also internalize and ask yourself those questions. You know, who am I mentoring right now? Who am I sponsoring? Who am I mentioning their name? I do think that this is key uh, as we talk about, you know, Black folks and what does our future look like in the mining industry? I think it begins with us. It begins with some of the people on the call today who are listening and hearing some of these experiences that you've all had. Uh, it brings me back to this idea of equality and equity and, you know, uh, and, and Annie, when we're talking about, uh, you know, when I think of sponsorship and sponsor uh, and, and mentorship, it, it makes me really think of this idea of fostering equity in a way, because if you have somebody sponsoring you, that is a, that is a leg up, right? Like being mentioned in a room, in my opinion, um, one, just to, to, for the group and for the people in, in the room, um, you know, sometimes when you're thinking about what does equity look like, you know, people are talking about equality and, and equity. And, and I think Annie, I'm just, I'm going to let you explain it more eloquently, but I want people to think of this image. Think of any store you've gone to, like a Walmart or a very popular store. I was going to say Sears, but we know what happened to Sears. But anyways, but Walmart, and you think about a wheelchair access. T today, it's so normal that every business should have you know, wheelchair access. So people who are, you know, not able-bodied are able to, to enter and shop and navigate the hallways freely. Now, this is what equity looks like to me is, it's not that we're saying we're changing all the designs, you know, because a certain group of people are special, but we're creating equitable environments. So Annie, in mining, when you think of equality and equity, can you help us? just differentiate the two and what that what might that look for for black professionals as we 
seek to be more actively involved in in mining and in influencing it? Well, I think it's one of those things where I always, you know, I, you and I have lots of debates uh, every day, pretty much sometimes yeah. about these buzzwords that we use, right? Like I think I, I, I call them buzzwords because no one really understands what some of this means. Uh, yeah. So equality, I think if we kind of just break it down a little bit, equality means each individual or group of persons are given um, the same resources, right? Or opportunities, but, e you know, e sorry, that's equality. Equity recognizes that each person is different or has different circumstances and um, allocates the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So you want to bring people to the same place. I don't know if that 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 sort of makes sense. So I think um, I can give you a different way of looking at it or an, an analogy from my from my own perspective is that I might go to um, an interview, for example, right? And you and I wearing the exact same dress, maybe not you and I. So I'm gonna call talk to my colleague Beth, who's over here. There's nobody here, but <laughs> I have a colleague Beth here, who's she, you know, we're wearing the same things, but and we have the exact same resume. Um, and then we're given a a sort of a test and we come out with the same uh, result on that test, but then Beth is given maybe an, an answer sheet, right? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't given that answer sheet, but at the end of the day, that means that she, re she received something that I didn't get. So I don't have the same opportunity to advance in that role. So I think we all need to sort of come to a place um, where we feel that both equality and equity are sort of coming together and, 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 and being one. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, there's a perfect, perfect image that I have in my head, which is, I think most people have seen it, where there's a fence mm -hmm. and then someone brings a stool, right? And then because somebody can't see over the fence, but you bring the stool right beside them and you put it and then so they climb up so that now they're seeing or you're all at the same height. So I think we all in the workplace, whether it's mining or anywhere, I think we need to find ways where we people feel like they belong, where there's equity and there is equality. I think it's it's both of those things need to intersect at some point. Yeah, and I mean, you you make me think of barriers. I I mean, yeah. you know, we 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 would all wish life was utopic. <laughs> yeah. uh, statistics tell us it's not. Um, yeah. Especially if you've been in the DNI space, there's a reason why you know, we are all on this, there's a momentum about creating inclusion, creating belonging, um, you know, fostering equity. And I'm really curious, uh, you know, Stanley, Michael, if, have you experienced any barriers, you would say, in the mining industry for your own career progression over the years, if you were to look back? And Stanley, you can go first. Thank you. Um I'll pause a moment to think if there's been some barriers that I have experienced. Maybe there are some that I haven't experienced knowingly, but maybe, mm -hmm. but thinking about consciously every day through my career, have I been held back because of certain sort of discriminations? I, honestly, not to sound cheesy or anything, but I don't yeah. think that there are barriers that I have seen so far in my career. And now I'm going to caveat that by saying maybe in some discussions that have been had, there might have been that I'm not privy to, but the ones that I have known, some of the things that I have wanted to do, I think so far I have been able to get uh, to the point where I wanted to go. But now mm -hmm. it gets a bit harder, right? As we begin to climb up in the corporate ladder, things get a bit more difficult because there are only so many positions as you go up in, in every corporation. So maybe it's up to the future to determine, but so far in the past, I, I, would, I would not. I guess I, I should have. ask it differently. Have you, maybe this is Michael or Annie, have you supported anyone else who has gone through barriers in their career? Because I, I, what, what I'll, maybe I'll, I'll share for myself personally, because I do mentor quite a few people. And I have met people who have really struggled with be it their accent and uh, people taking them seriously um, so that, you know, because of an accent and they've had to really 
bridge that gap between, yes, I have an accent, but yes, I'm also very intellectual and whatnot. So I would say that, you know, some of my personal insights come from the people that I mentor and I support in their careers. Uh, that makes me realize that, you know, barriers exist. And I don't know if any or Michael, if you want to add to that. Yeah, I'll add to that. So when I first came to Canada, um, I went to a lot of interviews and one of the barriers I kept getting, or one of the things that I found, which I is thought was a barrier, yeah. and it still is, I think in some instances today, is this whole Canadian experience. You do not have Canadian experience. Yeah. Um, I think for immigrants um, coming into this country, that is a big barrier because you hear that a lot. And I remember going to all these interviews. And when I came here as well, I know if you meant, I mentioned earlier that I'm from Zimbabwe originally, and a lot of people don't realize that because they always say, oh, you have a Canadian accent. So one of the things I did and I thought, okay, I'm gonna remove, this was a barrier that I thought was there for me, was I took elocution lessons to get rid of my accent. Because, um, you know, I, I found that as I was speaking, people weren't really listening to what I was saying. They were, because at the end, I could throw in a whole lot of stupid words in that sentence or whatever conversation. And people would just be like, oh, you know, nod their heads. Mm. And then later on, they're like, where are you from? Right? Yeah. Because the whole time I'm having this, this discussion with someone, in their mind, they're trying to figure out where is she from? So I, I took that upon myself, say, okay, well, I'm going to get rid of this accent so I can fit in. I don't know if that makes sense. And then, yeah. then there was... Even after I did that, there was still the, you don't have Canadian experience. So there was an educational barrier there. You don't have uh, work experience and you didn't go to school here. Um, so I remember the, the first, the last interview I went to at some point, I said, you know, I said, you know what, I've heard this like six or seven yeah. times. How am I supposed to get a Canadian experience when no one will yeah. actually open the door for me to get, get Canadian experience? You know? yes. So then he looked at me and he said, okay, you know what, I'm going to give you six months and I was there for three years and you know and awesome. it was when I left he, you know they were devastated They're like oh you know we don't want you to leave but again if I hadn't maybe sort of at that point to found my voice to speak up and ask that question because who asked that in an interview right or who said that in an interview <laughs> but that was that's the barrier that I think I had to overcome um, and then there's still those barriers that I do face as a woman of color even walking into a room sometimes and it doesn't help that my first name is Annie and last name is Lawrence <laughs> so sometimes really? people don't Sorry. realize that I'm I am black when I walk in the room people are completely surprised I'm like mm -hmm. well you know I'm not it's not Dorothy from Canada but you know it's just one of those things that I think um there are barriers that we face and some of those are just uh there are things that we you know I want to touch on what Stanley said you said you don't feel like there probably have been some barriers. You just haven't sort of attuned yourself to the fact that, okay, this is a barrier that I'm, that I'm facing. I mean, let's face it. We all have barriers. We, we, there's barriers in our careers. There's things I would have loved to be, you know, CEO somewhere, but I just haven't got there yet, <laughs> but I, you know, that's, that's the pathway. So I'm removing all those barriers. I mean, we always hear the term breaking that glass ceiling. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, Annie, what it makes me feel, like, as you say that, and, you know, Stanley um, yeah. and Michael, what it makes me feel is let's attune ourselves to what others around us might be experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say that because actually, ironically, someone reached out to me and said, uh, Teresa, what do I do if I'm encountering racism? And, and, and in that case, the person works for, I think, Postal Canada. Sorry, I shouldn't say the, the name of the company, but <laughs> works for a company. Yeah that does stuff with packages. And they had reached out and said, what do I do? And I think it's just recognizing that with this power that we have and this confidence, what are we going to do to advance the, you know, the, the conditions for the next person? And Michael? Yeah, so uh, I haven't seen anything, like I've not experienced anything of barriers of that sort through my career. As Stanley pointed out, probably might be there and, Maybe I'm not paid particular attention to it. But fortunately for me, like where I work currently, we have a our management team is diverse. General okay. manager is Australian, uh, 
uh, mine ops manager is somebody from DR Congo and migrated to Canada. We have a, a South African surface manager and I'm health and safety manager from Ghana originally. So I think that's really helped with uh, that diversity and inclusion in the workplace where I am at and I've been here for almost two, three years. And so I've not really experienced that uh, in here, but I have friends who've worked, who are working with other mining companies and I have had to help them navigate uh, such. And one is currently dealing with that. And there's somebody who is very confident. So it's just to sum it up, there's been, he felt that he's been blocked from uh, climbing up the ladder and his organization. And there's somebody that I know who is very, very confident and speaks up. So during the uh, uh, town hall meeting, he spoke up. He decided to take back, take the bullet for all the other black folks who were being <laughs> marginalized in the workplace. And he spoke up in the workplace. And as it stands now, he has direct uh, links to the director of his department who sits on the the board who is managing or the who sits on the board sorry and that person is mentoring him through this process and he and that person are putting together a program for diversity in his workplace so i think he's turned out good because he spoke about it That's and awesome. he took us he, he decided to take it up and I, I told him also to just go ahead with it but you know the fear is that when you try to talk about it and come up and speak up you'll be marginalized and you can be pushed into the corner right so, absolutely he, yeah he Absolutely. is somebody who doesn't who doesn't care about that, and he thinks that he can be the person who will lead the path for the future. And I also agreed with him, so I also helped him to uh, push that agenda, and it, it turned out to be good. So. Excellent. And you know, I love, about, I love yeah. hearing these stories. Um, and, and Stanley, just if you wanna go ahead, um, yeah. And just as a warning to the panelists, we're gonna go into our last question. So, could Stanley make it real brief, please? Very brief. So I do think um, that this is where DNI networks within corporations play a big role. So we do have the network within Sonkor that advocates for Black people. So I, I think that within organizations, Absolutely. these networks need to press this issue with mm -hmm. management to ensure that change comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up this idea of DNI networks. Um, just I know there are people on the call. Please let us know where these DNI networks are, particularly if you know of, of, of black uh, of black centered ones. It's also good to know. Um, I mean, all of them. I mean, LGBTQT, Indigenous networks. Um, you know, women. It's always interesting to see what the mining industry is doing. But I want to give some people. I want to give people on the call some tangible ways they can be allies for Black people. Um, one of the areas we obviously see a huge gap is Black people in leadership uh, in mining. Um, I'll start with, um, you know, any, if you want to get, what are some tips that people can can do to become an ally for this, um, for this in mining? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing is attending these types of events um, that are put on to understand um, where, so you can get a better understanding of where some of those issues are or where people are feeling a little bit um, sort of not a part of the conversation. I think if you become a part of the conversation so you can understand, um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll all find each other in a, in a better place. And I think, you know, simple things like just, um, you know, going to a colleague's house for dinner if they invite you, right? Even though they're a different, you know, they might be from a different culture. I think it's just understanding and just sort of being more, and ask questions, please do ask the questions. I think it's important for you to, to understand how you can address certain things. Cause I think people are afraid. I find them people are afraid to address me as a black and the, cause I, I can see they're trying to figure out how to describe me. And I'm like, I'm black. Yes, I'm a black woman. Uh, there is nothing wrong with saying that. It's, it, uh, you know, it, 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 that's how you would describe. I mean, the first thing you see when I walk in a room is okay, there's a woman and she's black. You don't know my name. Right. So mm -hmm. you never be afraid to be able to sort of recognize someone and recognize my difference, because I think if you see me, that means you actually if you recognize that I am a black woman, you're actually seeing. It, mm, that, thank that. you. Thank you, Annie. So, yes, yes recognize our differences. Mm -hmm. We're going to celebrate our differences. Michael, a quick tip to people on being an ally. Or how does it show up for you? How do you feel when somebody's being an ally? So uh, as, just to add to what Annie said, in, uh, just, we need to embrace diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. That's the first step to, to take if we embrace that and want to live 
like I can use myself as an example. Uh, for a very long time, I, I was just focused on my work and I wasn't really focused on diversity and inclusion. I know it was there. I read a lot of books. I listen to a lot of podcasts and all those stuff. Uh, but I wasn't really in the forefront or being involved in that. But so embracing it and accepting it that this is something that's there and you can also partake and help that uh, help improve that. That's I think that's key. And that's the first step to in moving forward. And also, as she said, you're black. So if just let people feel comfortable around you and if they want to address you as a black person, it's, it's not derogatory. That's your color. You just need to accept it and direct them in the right direction on whatever discussion that you're supposed to be talking about. OK, right on. And Stanley, what are some uh, symbol signs of allyship that people can demonstrate? You know, uh, within the DNI network for black people here at Songkor, one of the committees is led by a white Caucasian, Caucasian woman. There's no better definition of allyship than that, getting involved and actually participating because you want to learn, you want to understand what the differences are. That to me is how you can truly become an ally. Get yourself right into it and participate. Participate. And, you know, I'll add a couple more because we had, we had been talking about stuff, which, you know, we talked about, you know, this idea of folks be a sponsor. Feel, feel, find a way to, if you find somebody deserving, mention the name in, in, a, in a room full of opportunities. I, I, I know I, I recognize some people on the call today who have done that for me as well. Uh, you know, permission to learn on the job, ensuring that folks are being granted the same permissions. Uh, we're going to move into the question uh, period right now. Um, I would love if someone on the call would be brave enough to put something in the chat or raise their hand and unmute yourself. Let's uh, let's hear from you. And while we're waiting on that, I'm just going to add, I also chair our Diversity, Inclusion, Anti-Racism and Discrimination Committee for Lending Mining. And one yes. of the key things is for me was for that committee to work, we needed uh, to set the tone at the top. And uh, when you set up these GNI initiatives, just make sure that you have the top people who are sponsoring. We have, our, like our sponsor, for example, is our CEO. For, for that committee, but also the tone has been set, the board is involved, they, they yeah. want to hear some updates. So I think it's, uh, it's a, these, the networks are really important. Yeah, importance of networks. Yeah. And also leadership support, right? Leadership yeah. support, then? okay. Exactly, yeah. Kaylee and Marilyn both have a question. Okay, maybe Kaylee? You're on mute, Kaylee. No. Oh, um, any questions from the audience? Ma Marilyn, and then can you see the names there? I can't see the names for some reason. Okay. I see no, I think Marilyn has her hand up. Okay, go yeah, ahead. I have, yeah, I have my hand up. Just um, mm -hmm. what I wanted to um, sort of say. Uh, great event. I think you know we all have to put in the work to learn. So there's sort of reach in, into. I'm an engineer, so I think about battery limits, right? But we reach into each other's battery limits to make sure that we're we're connecting, right? But what I what I wanted to say, a question that I have, and I'm hearing this from you, like I'm sad, Danny, that you had to take elocution lessons to get rid of your accent. But my father-in-law had to do that. He was German, mm -hmm. and Germans were not liked after first, you know, the Second World yeah. War, right? So he yeah. completely got rid of his accent. But yeah. I find it disheartening that we put this burden on the underrepresented because you're already experiencing barriers and then you have to conform and to me that's not sustainable it's um i would say black women in their hair right yeah yeah so i just was wondering if you might um um just comment a little bit about that because it's exhausting it is, it is exhausting. And, and I have to say that I do regret losing my accent in, in some ways, although it comes out every so often when I've had a few. Awesome, times. when you're drinking. Yes, <laughs> and when I'm with, you know, people from Zim and I'm talking to my mom, because my husband sometimes tells me, he's like, whoa, your accent just came out there. But also, it, so I, I do feel sad now because I feel I have conformed, right? I, I had to change something about myself 
And so, you know, at times when I do sit there and think about it, I, I, I do feel sad. But again, it's a decision that I, I made and I have to live with it. But I think it's it's probably a story that resonates with a lot of people um, in, in terms of, you know, sometimes you're not heard as you're speaking. People are just, yeah. you know, so, yeah. And then the black hair thing, Marilyn, is a whole other panel. So we'll leave that one. <laughs> yeah. so, just, yeah. just a tip in uh, yeah. on that. Right. Yeah. So as a safety manager, mm -hmm. I stand in front of a lot of workers mm -hmm. to just make a talk, talk to them about safety. And sometimes you're like, well, these guys understand whatever I'm saying, but I've come to uh, terms that I need to speak to the issue. And I know when I'm speaking about issues and using the lingo that they understand, they will pick whatever is supposed to be, they are supposed to pick in that conversation or communication I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. So I, I sometimes I let my other safety or officers who are Caucasian speak, but when I want to make a point across myself, I stand up and speak in front of people. And I have, throughout the years, I have gained that confidence that I expect people to understand me. And I was telling my son the other day, he's nine, I was telling him that if some a Caucasian who has an accent comes to Ghana, if I was living in Ghana, that person, when that person speaks to us, we when we were kids, it was difficult for us to understand the person, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the same way if the, the tables have turned and I'm here, and I'm speaking to somebody, I expect the person to open their ears more to be able to understand me. Because when I was a kid, I had an English teacher who, had, who came from Canada to teach me English in primary school. It, it was tough. We all struggled a bit, but we had to pick up and try and understand her. So yeah. the tables of 10, it needs to be the same way here. As there you well. go. How, how, how serendipitous. OK, so I see um, there's somebody on the call who I cannot say their name, P-H-A-T-U-T-S. I can't pronounce that, but can you go ahead? PN initials. Yeah. Yeah, it's Molly. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think I've seen that before. But <laughs> Molly, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure you guys might have touched base on the question that I'm about to ask. Just maybe you can clarify further. So um, you spoke a lot about um, putting our hands up, doing the work, breaking the glass ceiling. So how do you propose that um, we do that in spaces where we don't feel included or listened to or in spaces where we feel small? How do we break out of those uh, psychological safety barriers? Can I go first? Yes. First of all, you're not small. Uh, you you are seen and you're heard. And again, I'm gonna go back to, I, I know you just touched on that, is find your voice. You have a voice, speak up, say what you want. Approach, whether it's your boss or you know, the next person that you feel comfortable with, go and speak to them and say, this is what I want, right? Like, I think you kind of have to take the power into your own hands because no one else is going to do it for you. And I think just the, that, it's, I know it sounds like we're, a broken record but you have to find your voice molly because otherwise you're you'll just be sitting there and thinking how do i do this there's no other way mm -hmm. uh, and also just you know maybe document all the things that you're doing and show that okay this is what i've done this year um but now i'm looking for that next thing i want to move on and again put up your hand if there is somebody else who's leaving the company ask because sometimes they don't tell you that someone's left in that job that posting is probably going to it shows up on linkedin but why not put your hand up to do it? So, exactly. I think so yeah. because of time, I'm going to go to Mafal this question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Annie. Sorry. I'm going to go on mute because. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, so, my question is uh, I've heard you speak about the challenge of the Canadian experience for people that are immigrants, minorities, et cetera. That ridiculous requirement that it's what is first the chicken or the egg and we go around so if we as an industry would like to you know hail our voice together and influence or lobby whomever we need to lobby organizations whatever who how do you address that how do we get collective um to have an initiative like this because we have been hearing for at least five years or more that mm -hmm. the mining and mineral exploration industry need more people that we that is an issue, and one of the ways to get through that is to have more more 
immigrants, more people from different parts, you know, help us with that. But if we have this Canadian experience, so how, what are the suggestions that you say, to whom do we talk, who in the government, what is our power to put our voice regarding this issue? So, so you know what, uh, just because I'm, 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 I apologize everybody as we're looking at the time now, um, and, and Mafalda, let's follow up with this question. It's a very important one. And uh, I see Marilyn is on the call. Marilyn, as some of you might know, is heavily involved with the professional engineers of Ontario and is very well versed with advocacy and regulations and policy. I think Mafalda, this is a conversation to pick up with uh, somebody like Marilyn, as well as the Mining Industry Human Resources Council and the work that they're doing around immigrants and, and whatnot. Uh, but these are, let's not dismiss this, but it's very, very important that we pick up that conversation. Okay, Mafalda, uh, keep me honest on that one. I'll, I'll connect you with uh, those two people. I think it's an important discussion, yeah. 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 Let's pick it I up. I think it is. I think yeah. it is. And just to chime in on that, um, similar experience, you know, with nurses, but because that conversation has been had over and over again, I think they're beginning to break down those barriers in that mm -hmm. industry. That is so true. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Anika, who's running the webinar in the background, to do a time check for us. Uh, I think we committed to X amount of time. Anika, what was our time slot? One hour. Yeah, we're, I think now we can do the wrap up. And yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. So you know, Heather, I see you on the call here. We're about to do a wrap up, but I am seeing so many powerful people on the call today who are truly doing movements in the mining industry uh, to make it more diverse, more inclusive. I I called out Heather Gamble because, and Heather, please put your website in the chat. Uh, Heather is doing a lot of work around uh, the supply chain and ensuring that women are included um, in the supply chain for mining. And, you know, we talk about equality and equity and you have to meet Heather. If you're at PDAC, make sure you make an effort to meet Heather and the group that they run. But what I want to do now is I want to wrap up. I, I, I really truly do want to thank uh, Stanley and Michael and Annie. Um, you know, not so long ago, it didn't feel safe in mining to speak about black experiences to even celebrate black history month or talk about it uh you know here we are in 2023 and i see seasoned professionals in annie michael and stanley putting themselves out there recognizing the mentorship you represent for people and i just want to thank you and appreciate you for gracing your time for cim so basically on, on behalf of cim and on behalf of the diversity inclusion advisory committee Thank you for participating today. We're gonna to stay connected to you. Now we know your names, where to find you. <laughs> we will definitely pull on you. And I just wanna thank you. I know that we're ending right now, uh, but you know, I, I, I do think it's fair for me to just give everybody like 15 second wrap up, uh, starting yeah. with Stanley. Just <laughs> 15 second, uh, any message for us as we go on? Thank you very much. We need to do more of this. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Michael? Yeah, thank you for having me too. Let's continue to build our skills, Let's seek out mentors. We have LinkedIn, we have other uh, avenues. Let's continue to use those avenues, like how I find you, Teresa, or how you found me. So let's continue <laughs> to use those avenues. Everyone, <laughs> I just stalked him on LinkedIn and pressed and I don't know what I was thinking, but hey, now he's here on the panel. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Annie? And for me, I think as we are going to be wrapping up Black History Month, I also want us to think about Black futures. They are, there is a future, a, a, new, a generation behind us um, that probably is not aware that mining exists. And I think it's, it's our job. I think a friend of mine just recently you know, mentioned how mining is generational. Yeah. Um, people don't know about it. So I think we need to start going out to schools and talking about mining. And I always tell Teresa this, if it's not mined, it's grown. So, you know, we are we are here, uh, everything in our homes, our phones, whatever we're using now, it's something, part of it was mined. So I think we need to uh, to get out there and, and, and sort of get that next generation excited. I mean, mining is probably, you know, a, a sort of a, a dying industry in a way, right? I mean, let's let's try to keep it going. Right. Okay. So, so with that, thank you very much, Annie. We're going to stop recording, but thank you everyone for joining. And we're just going to speak chat freely with whoever's staying on the call. So we'll, we'll stop the recording. Uh, thank you, Annika.